Um, if you weren't here last night, I just want to say my name is Michael Branch. I'm the pastor of the host church, Bright Star Bible Church. And on behalf of our church family, we want to welcome you to Clouds Without Water with Justin Peters. Uh, we had a wonderful time last night. If those of you guys were here last night, and uh, we're looking forward to a wonderful day today as well. I would just ask um, that as we enter into the day that you just uh, take a moment and, and uh, consider your heart, the posture of your heart, and, and why we're here. We're here because we want to draw close to the Lord. We're here because we want to be exposed to the truth of God's Word. And sometimes uh, that hurts a little bit. Sometimes it feels like our shins are getting kicked and it makes us wiggle in our chair a little bit. And that's a good thing because, you know, like 90% of the sermons we hear today are, uh, are milk, okay? They're, they're, they're edifying, they're uplifting, they're positive. But the, the times that really, I think, grow us the most are when we're confronted by things that we believe or think that are not biblical. And so we, we tend to adopt cultural Christianity, and we stop questioning what God's Word actually says. And so I want to challenge each and every person here this morning and throughout the day, it's okay to question and examine what you believe and why you believe it and make certain that it aligns with what God's Word actually says, and you don't believe things just because some man said it or because you were raised a certain way, we believe it because God's Word says it. Amen? Amen. All right. So with that being said, just a couple things, housekeeping things. Um, we, uh, are, we've done our best with the sound. It's a little bit quiet, so you just have to be like, you know, you're in a, you're in a college classroom and, and you're listening intently. Uh, if, if Kids are welcome. If they get uh, to be a distraction, we just ask their chairs outside. They're, the sound's on in the foyer, so you won't miss what Justin is saying. And uh, this morning, I've asked my wife and my two daughters to uh, start us out with the Lord's Prayer today. So if you would, we'll just uh, listen and be prayerful. If you know the song, feel free to sing along. Our Father, which art in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory Thank you, sisters, for that. Good morning. Good morning. Hope everyone is doing well this morning. It is a joy to be with you once again, and uh, we will dive right in here. So now we kind of begin clouds without water in earnest. We'll get into the meat and potatoes of the Word of Faith movement and the heresies that they teach, and then we will correct each point of heresy with Scripture. 
And uh, what I try to model in my seminar is Titus chapter 1, verse 9. Paul says that we are to both teach sound doctrine and refute those who contradict it. A lot of people would say, oh, well, this is just kind of a negative thing you're doing. You're talking about all the error. Well, fact of the matter is 26 of the 27 books in the New Testament directly warn about false doctrine and or false teachers. Only the short little book of Philemon has nothing to say about false doctrine or false teachers, at least not directly. So uh, 26 of the 27 books of the New Testament do, and most of those books multiple, multiple times. In fact, Jude is, the entire book of Jude is devoted to it. So warning about false doctrine and false teachers is a prominent theme in the New Testament. And so to not do that is to ignore a great deal of what we have in our Bibles. This is a task that we must do. So this session is entitled Dangerous Doctrines. And in this session, we will look at the standard doctrines which the faith preachers teach that deviate from historical Christianity. I want us to begin by looking at the doctrine known as positive confession. The faith preachers teach that we can actually speak things into existence. Watch this from Levi Lusco. God made you, made you in his image, the image of a creator who created by speaking. He said, let there be light, and there was. He said, let there be an earth, he let, let there be dolphins, and there were because he spoke them. He's a creative God who spoke these things into existence, and then he made you in his image. So you were created by a creator to create. And one of the chief ways you create is by participating with God in creation through speaking. The Bible echoes from the Old to the New Testament that life and death are caught up in the power of the tongue. So every single time you speak, there's an act of creation. So when you speak, there is an act of creation. The faith preachers teach that just as God spoke things into existence, you and I can use our own words of faith to speak things into existence. You might notice that he quoted Proverbs 18.21, which says death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they take that and they say, well, see, we can speak life and death. We can speak things into existence. But as is common with the faith preachers, they only quote to you part of a verse, or if they do quote the whole verse, they take it out of its context. Let me show you Proverbs 18.21 in its entirety. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. So you see, when you read the whole verse, it doesn't mean what the faith preachers claim it means. Let me show you what Alan P. Raw says in the Expositor's Bible Commentary of this text. He says, those who enjoy talking, in other words, indulging in it, must bear its fruit, whether good or bad. The lesson is to be warned, especially if you love to talk. So this is actually a warning to us. What this is saying is that if you are one of those people who likes to engage in gossip, then you better be ready to bear the consequences of it because there will be some. The Bible has a lot to say about warning us about the dangers of the unbridled tongue. Gossip is a serious sin, very serious. It's listed in Romans chapter 1, serious sin. But this is not saying that we can literally speak things into existence. That's not what that verse is talking about. Kenneth Copeland says this, faith was, faith was the raw material substance that the Spirit of God used to form the universe. The faith preachers do not believe that God created ex nihilo, out of nothing. Rather, they believe that when God spoke, his words were containers of a physical, tangible substance called faith, hence word of faith. And everything that exists, they say, is made out of faith. The chair that you're sitting in right now, that's made out of faith. The car in the driveway, the tree in the ground, if you break it down to its basic components, you wouldn't find atoms and molecules, you would find faith. Everything is made out of faith. And when God spoke, his words were containers of this tangible substance called faith. 
word of faith. And we as believers, they say we can use our own words of faith to speak things into existence and to create our own physical reality. That is heresy. Dear friends, only God can create. The Hebrew word for create is bara, and only God baras. Only God can create out of nothing. The faith preachers blur that line between God the creator and us his created. They demote God to make him look human, and then in turn they deify man to make us look like God. This from Creflo Dollar, undoubtedly the most aptly named of the prosperity preachers. But Creflo Dollar says, as spiritual beings who possess the nature of God, we have the ability to speak things into existence just like God did. So yeah, they actually teach this, that we can speak things into existence just like God. Jesse Duplantis says this, The Bible says that every man has been given the measure of faith. Have faith in your faith, not faith in God. Have faith in your faith and step over into the faith zone, whatever that is. So you see in the prosperity gospel, in the word of faith movement, faith is not placed in God. Faith is a force that you direct at God to make him do whatever you want him to do. Basically, God is our cosmic bellhop, and we use our faith as a force to make God do whatever we want him to do. And it is truly ironic that these people who call themselves faith preachers have a fundamental misunderstanding of what faith actually is. They don't even know what faith is, and yet they call themselves faith preachers. How strong are our words? The words that we speak, well, so strong that if you don't like the weather, then you can just change it. Watch this from Gloria Copeland, one of the more well-known clips in my seminar, but watch this. You know, you're you're supposed to control the weather. I mean, Ken's the primary weatherman at our house, but when he's not there, I do it. You can see what's happening out there. Shows just like they have on at the weather, like on the news. I mean, he's got the computers, got the current weather on it and all that for flying. So uh, sometimes I'll hear something. I'll hear the thunder start. Maybe he'll still be asleep. And I'll say, Ken, you need to do something about this. <laughs> and knowing that, but you are the one that has authority over the weather. One day, Ken and Pat Boone, well, we were in Hawaii at their house, and we were, they were sitting outside. And there was a weather spout out over the ocean. And that's like a tornado, except it hits the water. And so they were sitting there, and they just watched it, rebuked it. It never did anything. One day, I was in the airplane in the back, and my little brother was in the back with me, and Ken was up front flying. And we were not in the weather, because we don't fly bad weather. But we, we could see the weather over here. And I looked out the window, and that tornado came down just like this down toward the ground. And Ken said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. You get back up there. So this is how I learned how to talk to tornadoes. I saw this. And that tornado went, whoop, 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 whoop. <laughs> Even while I was watching and my little brother was not a devout Christian at that time, and that was really good for him to see. <laughs> so you're the weatherman. You get out there or the weather woman, whichever it is, and you talk to that thing and you tell it you're not coming here, I command you to dissipate and you get back up there in Jesus' name. Glory to God. That, that, I won't charge you extra. <laughs> you know, that doesn't even really need or deserve a comment. It kind of <laughs> pretty obvious the problems with it. But the first thing I would point out, did you notice how she says, We can control the weather, but we don't fly in bad weather. (laughs) Why not? I mean, if you can control the weather, fly through whatever you want to fly through. You know, just talk to it before you get there. You know, aside from the theology, dear friends, just a little common sense. Just a little common sense clears a lot of this stuff up. But, dear friends, there is only one who controls the weather, and that is God. And that is God. Now, you might remember a couple of years ago, 
the big freeze, 2021, February of 2021. Remember that? Uh, it, of course, hit Texas, and I know it had to hit here, too. Uh, did an awful lot of damage, didn't it? It uh, did not leave Kenneth Copeland's compound unscathed, either. Uh, watch this from uh, George and Terry Pearson's. They're kind of like um, the second higher up at Kenneth Copeland's ministries, but watch this. Hey, why don't we do this? Let's show them the video. The video. This, this video, it's a short video, uh, and it's, it was reported by our head of maintenance and construction, Ethan Cerrone. What a tremendous man of God he, he is, and what a job that those guys did. But it'll give you a picture of what took place on the campus. So guys, if we could roll that video, and then we'll finish this up. I'm Ethan Cerrone, Director of Facilities here at Kenneth Copeland Ministries. You're probably already aware of the extreme weather event that hit Texas in mid-February. And if you've been watching Eagle Mountain International Church, you're aware of some of the damage that occurred to the property and the equipment here on campus. While the impact was significant, we want you to know that faith never stops and neither will we. Across campus, many cooling towers froze. EMIC, KCBC, headquarters, multiple buildings had damage to the heating and cooling system. Also in the headquarters building, we took damage from the sprinkler system. Our sprinkler heads froze, pipes froze, causing water flooding on all three levels. That extensive damage, we have not started to fix yet. One of our TV buildings, Revival Radio, a pipe burst in the ceiling above the green room, causing flooding in that room and extensive damage. We were able to stop it from getting into the actual TV studio area where we do our shooting. Now, thankfully, the ministry has insurance that will cover some of the cost. But as many of you have experienced, after paying the deductible, insurance still takes some time and doesn't always cover everything. <laughs> so the Texas Big Freeze 2021 caused hundreds of thousands of dollars of damage to Kenneth Copeland's own compound. I thought he could control the weather. Why didn't he just command a little heat wave, you know, come up and would have saved himself a, a lot of money and saved you a lot of money because you notice they did this video to raise money to do the repairs. Kenneth Copeland brags about being a billionaire with a B. Kenneth Copeland is the wealthiest preacher in the Northern Hemisphere the wealthiest in the United States of America by far. He could pay for all of these repairs out of his own pocket. It would be lunch money for Kenneth Copeland. But oh no, he'd rather get it from you. And yet he claims he'd be, he can control the weather. Hypocrite. Hypocrite and liar. This from John Hagee. Oh, John Hagee. John Hagee's not word of faith, is he? Oh yeah, yes he is. I believe that when a person says, I wish I were dead, he or she invites the spirit of death to invade his or her life. When an unhappy wife says, my marriage is a failure, she has pronounced the doom of this relationship. When a pregnant mother says, I don't want this baby, she is pronouncing the termination of her pregnancy or a curse upon the life of a child yet to be born. Speech is that powerful. Is it really? So according to John Hagee, if a pregnant mother, for whatever reason, simply verbalizes the words, I don't want this baby, she can actually kill her baby in her womb. Where is the sovereignty of God in all of this? Where is the sovereignty of God? They have no concept of God's sovereignty. The God of the prosperity gospel, little g God, is a very weak, very indecisive, very effeminate God. And it is not the God of the Bible. It's not the God of the Bible. You might remember the account in Luke's gospel when the angel Gabriel gave the announcement to Elizabeth and her husband Zechariah that they were going to have a baby. Remember? Of course, he would be John the Baptist, but they were older, right? They were advanced in years, past that stage in life. And when Zechariah heard about this, he questioned it, right? He pushed back on it a little bit. What did God do in response to Zechariah's questioning? What did God do? Closed his mouth, right? Made him a mute. For a very interesting take on why God closed Zechariah's mouth, 
this from Joel Osteen. Joel Osteen says this, why did God take away his speech? It's because God knew that Zechariah's negative words would cancel out his plan. See, God knows the power of our words. He knows that we prophesy our future, and he knew Zechariah's own negative words would stop his plan. Wow. So according to Joel Osteen, God was up in heaven looking down, and he saw Zechariah making negative confessions, and God just went into a panic. You know, oh my goodness, you know, what, what am I ever going to do? I, I wasn't counting on this. Zechariah is going to mess up everything. And so in a last-ditch effort to save his plan of redemption, God had to reach down and close Zechariah's mouth and make him a mute. Whew, boy, <laughs> that was a close one. Unbelievable. No concept of God's sovereignty at all on any level. Speaking things into existence, something that only God can do, leads us to our next doctrine of the faith movement, and that is the little God's doctrine. All of the faith preachers teach that if you are a Christian, you are, in fact, a little God. Uh, watch this from Creflo Dollar. Twenty-six and verse 27, God now submits himself to this principle of everything producing after its own kind. And in verse 26 and 27, let's read it out loud. Ready? Read. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have the fish of the sea, the the air, and all the earth, and 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 the earth, the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Now that's interesting because if everything produces after its own kind, we now see God producing man. And if God now produces man, and everything produces after its own kind, If horses get together, they produce what? And if dogs get together, they produce what? If cats get together, they produce what? But if the Godhead gets together and say, let us make man, then what are they producing? They're producing gods. Now, I got to hit this thing real hard in the very beginning because I ain't got time to go through all this, but I'm going to say to you right now, you are gods, little g. You are gods because you came from God, and you are gods. You're not just human. The only human part about you is this physical body that you live in. The real me is just like God. The real me is just like God blasphemy blasphemy dear friends when the Bible says that God created man in his image that means that as human beings you and I are the pinnacle of his creation we are the pinnacle of his creation and we have the potential we have the capacity through a saving relationship with Jesus Christ to know God none of the other created order has that privilege and ability I love dogs I do. I grew up with dogs, uh, black labs. Uh, I love dogs. Uh, my wife got me a, a dog seven or eight years ago for Christmas. Uh, she didn't want a dog at all. I wanted a big dog, and so she compromised, and she got me what is technically a dog. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little 10-pound, you know, a little frou-frou dog with a little bow in her hair, you know. Look. Any guy could have a big old German Shepherd or a black lab. It takes a real man to have a dog like my dog and be secure in his manhood. So, and I've got, you got one. And so, and I've come to love the socks off that little dog, but you know what? That little dog, Mia is her name. Mia will never know God because she's not created in God's image. We are. We have the potential, we have the capacity 
through a saving relationship with Christ to know God, but that does not mean that we are gods. The Bible is very clear. There is only one God, and he is a jealous God who will not share his glory with another. And if I remember my Bible correctly, wasn't the desire to be just like God kind of what led to the whole fall thing in the first place? Isn't that ironic? The very first temptation, which led to the very first sin, the desire to be just like God, what led to the whole fallen state in the first place, the faith preachers are teaching is truth. They want you to believe it. The very thing that led to the fall in the first place. How ironic. How ironic. Who else in the Bible wanted to be just like God? Satan did. He wanted the glory that God was getting for himself. And he rose up in rebellion against God and it got him and a third of the angels along with him kicked out of heaven. So this little God's doctrine is quite literally, quite literally a doctrine of demons. And yet the faith preachers teach it as truth. See how dark this is? I want to show you a couple of clips from Kenneth Copeland. Now the first clip is going to be from the 1980s. The second clip is going to be from just a couple of years ago. And I'm showing you these two clips from Kenneth Copeland separated by decades to show you that Kenneth Copeland and the faith movement has not changed at all. Watch. And I say this with all respect so that it don't upset you too bad, but I say it anyway. When I read in the Bible where he says, I am, I just smile and say, yes, I am too. When I read in the Bible where he says, I am, I just smile and I say, I am too. Unbelievable. That was from the 1980s. This from a couple of years ago. Let this mind be in you. Let this be the way you think. Let this mind be in you, which was also in the anointed Jesus who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And you do not think it robbery. You don't, it, it's not taking anything away from God right. to be equal with our Father, to be equal with our Lord Jesus. He's the one that caused it to happen. And our good God said, oh, yeah, they're my children. Of course they're equal to me. I gave birth to them. Again with the eyes. But he says, oh, yeah, of course they're equal to me. They're equal. We're, we're equal to God. It is just absolutely unbelievable. Watch this from Chris Vallotton. Chris Vallotton is kind of like Bill Johnson's right-hand man at Bethel Church, Redding, California. The reason why you can heal the sick, raise the dead, and cast out demons is because of who you are. Jesus didn't say, pray for the sick. He said, heal the sick. Well, only God can heal the sick. That's why he said, be imitators of God. Listen, I can't heal the sick. Only God can heal the sick. That's right. You are sons of God. In fact, Jesus quoted the psalmist when he said, You are gods, and the word is gods is little g. Ye is big G, and you are little g. You're little g, God. I understand we're not Mormons. Don't take this too far. Too late. <laughs> you just took it too far. And it's interesting how he kind of, he, it's like he feels the tension there. He's like, yeah, yeah, we're not like Mormons. Well, yeah, you are actually. You're exactly like Mormons. That is Mormon theology, that we are all gods. That's Mormon theology. It is Mormon theology packaged a little bit differently for a different audience. That's all it is. That's all it is. Watch this from Stephen Furtick. Um, Stephen Furtick 
said this in 2021. It's a pretty shocking watch. I'm not in covenant with a person. I'm not in covenant with a political party. I'm in covenant with God Almighty. I am God Almighty. I am God Almighty. Now, when that clip started kind of making the rounds, people were saying, oh, can you believe Stephen Furtick said this? You know, he said, I am God Almighty. And some of his, some of his defenders were saying, well, you know, he just... He didn't really mean that the way it came out. He just got a little tongue-tied, just a little kind of an inarticulate moment, a Joe Biden moment. You know, it just wasn't, <laughs> wasn't real articulate. And when I saw it, I mean, I've been calling Stephen Furtick a false teacher for a long time. And, uh, and even I thought, okay, I don't think he actually meant that he's God Almighty. That was until I saw this sermon that he preached two years before in which he said basically the same thing. God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. You are not my maker. You will not be my mirror. When God said, I am to Moses, you know, my name is I am. He was trying to get him to see you are as I am. So yeah, actually, apparently he did mean it. It's just unreal. And Stephen Furtick is Southern Baptist, at least on paper. Was Southern Baptist, yeah, I think just recently left, yeah. Um, Michael Todd, y'all know who Michael Todd is, don't you? So Michael Todd has been a rising star in the Word of Faith, the Prosperity Gospel Movement in the last few years. It has, it's had a meteoric rise in popularity. There's a lot that can be said about Michael Todd, but I want you to watch this video as he's trying to explain to us the Godhead. Watch this. You've just been taught wrong. It's one God. Everybody say one God. One God. Say it like you mean it. One God. Three expressions. Okay. Okay, I'm going to pause it right there. One God, three expressions. That's modalism. Modalism is the belief that God is one God but has three different manifestations, three different expressions. In other words, basically modalism believes that, that in the Old Testament God had his father hat on. And then uh, when Jesus came, he took off the father hat, put on his son hat, and then now has his Holy Spirit hat on, and he can change hats at will. But so one God in this three manifestations. That is what T.D. Jakes believes. T.D. Jakes is a modalist. This comes from the oneness Pentecostal denomination. That is an explicit denial of the Trinity, and if you deny the Trinity, you are denying the God of the Bible. In fact, you can go to T.D. Jake's website right now. Look it up in his doctrinal statement. He says, we believe in one God in three manifestations, not persons, three manifestations. That's modalism. Biblical theology is that God is one God, one being, in three distinct persons, but still one God. That's biblical theology, but that's not what Michael Todd teaches so anyway, watch this. What is this? It's water. That, 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 that's, that's what we say, but if you want to be very scientific, this is H2O. Okay? This is H2O. I'm thirsty. That's Let me ask you a different question. What, hold on real quick. We established this is what? It's H2O. What is this? You say ice? If we go down to its basic form, this is H2O. Now, it's in a different form than the liquid version, but this still is. Uh huh. This is a different expression. What is this? This is H2O2. It's dry ice. 
and it's a different expression. So if that was God the Father, God the Son, this is God the Holy Spirit. Still H2O, but it takes on a completely different form. Oh, and this is what God is about to do in your life. You're about to see evidence. <laughs> now, not to be nitpicky, but dry ice is not H2O. It's CO2, not H2O. But he's so enthusiastic about his error. So. But dear friends, that illustration, that's modalism. That is classic modalism. And so many people try to come up with all these analogies for the Trinity, the triune nature of God. Oh, he's like water. You see, you know, sometimes water is liquid and sometimes it's, it's a solid and then sometimes it's a vapor, even though CO2, but whatever. You know, no, that is not what God is like at all on any level. Isaiah 40, verse 25, this is God speaking. To whom then will you liken me that I would be his equal, says the Holy One. Dear friends, this is not a challenge. This is not God saying, okay, I want you to come up with an analogy that explains my triune nature. And you see these illustrations, you know, water, you see, well, God's like an egg, you know, an egg. You've got, you've got the shell, then you've got the white part, and then you've got the yolk, and it's three parts, but it's one egg. You know, God's like an egg. Or, or God's like a three-leaf clover, you see. Uh, well, God's kind of like uh, one of us. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a husband, and I'm a, a son, and I'm a brother, and uh, I'm a father, and I'm a grandfather, and so, you know, I have all these different roles, but I'm just one person. No. No, dear friends. The whole point in what God is saying here is that there is no one, there is no thing that you can compare God to. So please, please, please do away with all these dumb analogies of the Trinity. And if you teach Sunday school to little kids or vacation Bible school, please, 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 please do not tell them that the that God is like an egg or a three-leaf clover. He's not. There is no one, there is no thing that we can compare God to. That's the whole point. He is unique. He is without equal. Watch this from um, Jesse Duplantis. What you're about to see may be the most blasphemous things I've ever heard from Jesse Duplantis, and that's saying a lot, but watch this. Now, you might notice he has a big bow on, him, on his shoulder. The reason, this was Christmas uh, a year ago, and uh, Jesse Duplantis was talking about how Christians are gifts given, he says, given by the Son to the Father. Now, we talked about that last night. We're, we're not gifts given from the Son to the Father. It's the other way around, but at any rate. They never let the Bible get in the way of their theology. But Watch this from Jesse Duplantis. So when you understand, then you'll understand the book of Isaiah, chapter 9. I want to read verse 6. For unto us, Isaiah 9, verse 6, For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Yet the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 1 says, Be ye therefore imitators of God as dear children. So when I look at Isaiah 9, 6, where is the government now? It's on us. The government of the world is on mankind. And because we're made in God's image and in God's likeness, you can call us wonderful, counselor, mighty God, Christ in us, the everlasting Father, woo, the Prince of Peace. That's what it means to be the gift. Jesse Duplantis actually has the unmitigated gall to make himself the subject of Isaiah chapter 9. 
talking about Christ. Absolutely unbelievable. The little gods, it has gotten so bad in the Word of Faith movement today, it's so bad that they've pretty much dropped the little from the little gods doctrine. They just say, we're equal to God. It is absolutely unbelievable. Dear friends, there is only one God, and we ain't him. He is a jealous God who will not share his glory with another. But this little God's doctrine is at the heart of the prosperity theology. Let me show you. I want us to look at what the faith preachers teach about the doctrine of the fall. Number one, the faith preachers teach that Adam was an exact duplicate of God. He was not a little like God. He was not a lot like God. That Adam literally was a carbon copy of Yahweh. Yahweh, when he created man, Adam was a carbon copy of himself. Yahweh reproduced himself in Adam. Well, we all know what happened, right? Adam sinned, which, of course, begs the question. If Adam was Yahweh and he sinned, was it Yahweh who sinned? You see, you carry these doctrines out to their logical conclusion, and you see how heretical they really are. But when Adam sinned, he lost his godhood, lost his deity, transferred it to Satan, and when this happened, the real Yahweh God lost his legal right to planet Earth and was kicked out. And so according to classic word faith theology, God is up there somewhere, but he's got no access to planet Earth. He's been kicked out of his own creation. Well, someone has to fill that void, right? So Satan is all too eager to step up to the plate, and Satan becomes the legal God of planet Earth. Dear friends, Satan is not the legal God of planet Earth. God is the legal God of planet Earth. The Earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein, Psalm chapter 24. Satan is referred to in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, as the God of this age. Now, some translations say the God of this world, but a better rendering of that word in the Greek, aeon, is age. Paul's saying Satan is the God of this age. Paul is making a theological point not a legal point. Paul is saying that this world is so fallen, so sinful, so depraved that it follows after Satan as if he were the God of this age, but not the legal God of planet Earth. God is the legal God of planet Earth. Well, guess what happens when a person gets saved? Guess what he gets back? Ah, he gets his godhood back. He regains his deity. He becomes God again, just like Adam supposedly was before he fell. And this is why the faith preachers hold so tenaciously to health and wealth, because we're gods. And a god cannot be poor, and a god certainly cannot be sick. So many people think that this movement is just about health and wealth, you know, Rolex watches, private jets, healing, that kind of stuff. No. Health and wealth is just some of the bad, low-hanging fruit that comes off of this rotten theological tree that is the Word of Faith movement. It's just some of the bad fruit hanging off of the dead branches of this rotten tree. But the allure of health and wealth is what makes this movement so appealing and yet so dangerous at the same time. Because the prosperity gospel basically says this, Come to Jesus because he'll make you wealthy and he'll heal your body. They appeal to two of the most basic and universal of all human desires. Most people would like to be wealthy. And almost everyone would like to be physically healed. Now, there's a few people out there that like to be sick just because they like the attention that comes with it. But most of us, if we had our druthers right, we'd rather not be sick. And so the prosperity gospel says, well, if you'll just come to Jesus, then he'll make you rich, and he'll heal your body. Oh, so wait a minute. Let me get this straight. You're telling me that if I become a Christian, if I ask Jesus into my heart, to use that phraseology, then God's going to make me rich, and I'll never be sick again? <laughs> Sign me up, man. 
You know, I, I like that Jesus. You got two of them? I, I'll take them both. But is that the real gospel? Or is the real gospel something a little bit more like this? Come to Jesus because you're a sinner. And because of your sin, the righteous wrath of God abides on you. And the only way to have that wrath removed is to repent of sin, turn from sin, and place your trust in the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And then, one day, you will have heaven, one of these days. But on this earth, we're not promised money. We're not promised healing. What are we promised? We're promised persecution. That's what we're promised. What does the Bible say? Some of those who live godly in Christ Jesus may be persecuted. Is that what it says? All who live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It's not, not quite as popular, you see. It's saying, come to Jesus because he'll make you rich and you'll never be sick again. If you come to Jesus for those reasons, dear ones, you have come for the wrong reasons. You have trusted a false Jesus and a false gospel. And a different gospel does not save. I want us to look how the faith preachers soften sin. You might notice that the prosperity preachers don't talk much about sin. Or if they do, it's just kind of in general terms. Uh, if they do talk about sin, it's more likely in these terms. Well, sin is just something that hurts you. It, it holds you back. It just prevents you from having your best life now. Uh, they never talk about sin in biblical terms, that sin is high treason committed against a thrice holy God that incurs his righteous wrath. You never hear about sin in those terms. Uh, watch this from Jesse Duplantis and Kenneth Copeland. They're talking about Zacchaeus. This is astonishing. Watch this. You know, I, I was preaching this the other day, that opposites attract, but so the outcasts attract. Zacchaeus was an outcast, but so was Jesus on the other spectrum, an outcast. Now think about that. When he saw that man, Zac, I could just call him Zac, he saw something in Zacchaeus yes, that did. no one else did. You know what he saw? Most people believe in original sin. Some people believe in original sin. He believed in original goodness. I said, the Lord told me, he said, I believe in original goodness. I can see the good in that man. Yeah, he did. Jesus told Jesse Duplantis of Zacchaeus, he said, I believe in original goodness. I can see the good in that man. Really? Now, you look like a smart class, and there's probably several verses that are popping into your head right now. There are. Just a couple of them, Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. Does that sound like original goodness to you? doesn't to me either. Romans chapter 3, 10 through 12. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become what? Worthless. There is none who does good, not even one. The Bible knows nothing about man's original goodness. We are all born sinners by nature, by choice. Jesse Duplantis, that is an explicit denial of the gospel, an explicit denial of the gospel. Rick Warren tweeted this last year. He said, for me, hell would be if God showed me all he could have done through my life and all the blessing I could have known if I had just trusted him a little bit more. So, you know, Rick Warren is not, at least on paper, not word of faith. Rick Warren, let me tell you what Rick Warren is. Rick Warren is a theological chameleon. Rick Warren is whoever his audience is on that particular occasion. Rick Warren changes his theology like we change our socks. So he says, for me, hell would be just seeing what God could have done through his life. Well, Rick, it doesn't matter what hell is to you. What matters is 
is how does God define hell? And God defines hell as the lake of fire where the worm will not die, the fire will not be quenched, there will be wailing, weeping, gnashing of teeth, the full undiluted fury of God's wrath will be poured out on the unrepentant for all of eternity. That is what hell is. Not just realizing what God could have done through you. It's just unreal. Watch this from J.D. Greer and Ed Litton. Now, J.D. Greer is a former president of the Southern Baptist Convention, and Ed Litton was his immediate successor. Both of them pastors. Now, I'm going to show you clips from a sermon that J.D. Greer was preaching, and the subject matter is homosexuality. That sermon he preached in 2019. Then you're going to see a clip of Ed Litton, J.D. Greer's successor, in a sermon that he preached on homosexuality almost exactly one year later. Watch this. A couple teachers here, and who's actually leading a women's conference, she said, she said, we ought to whisper about what the Bible whispers about, and we ought to shout about what it shouts about. And the Bible appears more to whisper when it comes to sexual sin compared to its shouts about materialism and religious pride. In the Bible, sexual sin is whispered compared to the shout God makes about greed and judgmentalism. Now, aside from the plagiarism, and that is what's going on here, so J.D. Greer and Ed Litton say, say that the Bible whispers about sexual sin. Really? Well, my Bible says that sexual sin is not to even be named among God's children. My Bible says that sexual sin leaves a wound and the reproach will never be fully blotted out. My Bible says that sexual sin is sin committed inside of the body, not outside of the body. There is something especially pernicious and especially injurious about sexual sin that is not true of other sin. Now, please do not misunderstand me. God expends no more anthropomorphic energy, if you will, forgiving us of sexual sin than he does forgiving us of lying or stealing. We can be judicially forgiven of sexual sin just as cleanly as any other sin. But just because we've been forgiven judicially doesn't automatically remove the earthly consequences of that sin. And there is something unique about sexual sin that leaves a wound. It leaves a scar because it is sin that is committed inside of the body, not outside of the body. The Bible does not whisper about sexual sin. Ask, and remember, he was talking about homosexuality. Ask the residents of Sodom and Gomorrah as fire and brimstone was raining down upon them from heaven. Ask them if that sounded to them like a whisper. Dear friends, the Bible doesn't whisper about any sin, much less sexual sin. You people to get to heaven. Where do we go wrong thinking LGBT people can't go to heaven? Homosexuality does not send you to hell. You know how I know that? Because heterosexuality does not send you to heaven. Homosexuality does not send people to hell. How do I know that? Because heterosexuality doesn't send people to heaven. Again, aside from the plagiarism, homosexuality does not send people to hell. How do I know that? Heterosexuality doesn't send you to heaven. What a dumb thing to say. I mean, I'm sorry, you would, have to, you would have to have a theological IQ below freezing to believe that statement. Homosexuality absolutely will send you to hell. I mean, has he read 1 Corinthians chapter 6? Paul says, do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. It absolutely will send you to hell. Now, it's not the only sin that will send you to hell because every sin will send us to hell. But homosexuality absolutely will. 
And if you die in that state as an unrepentant homosexuality, Paul says, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, do not be deceived. You will not inherit the kingdom of God. It is not the unforgivable sin. Because after Paul gives this list of sins, and he says, do not be deceived, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Then he says something very beautiful. And he says, such were some of you. You were those things, but you're not anymore. You were a reviler, but you're not anymore. You were a drunkard, you're not anymore. You were a homosexual, but you're not anymore. For you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified. God spends no more energy saving someone out of homosexuality than he does saving them out of anything else. And if you're in Christ, God has saved you out of that, praise the Lord. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have been made new. But to say that it will not send you to hell is in direct opposition to what Scripture teaches. And by the way, just as a little aside, as I travel around, you know, I'm, I'm in a lot of airports and I meet a lot of people and I've witnessed to a lot of homosexuals, and sometimes I'm asked, well, how do, you, how do you witness to a homosexual? Same way I witness to anybody else. You know, not all the time, but most of the time, you know, let's be honest, you can tell when you're talking to a homosexual, most of the time, maybe not all the time, but most of the time. And when I'm talking to a homosexual, I share the gospel with that person the same way I do with any other person. Telling that we're sinners because it's not just homosexuality that's sending that person to hell. He's got a thousand other sins that are also sending him to hell equally because he's not just a homosexual. He's also a liar. He's also a blasphemer. He's also a thief. And so I give him the plain gospel. Now, the only time I will drill down on homosexuality if that person is a homosexual and also claims to be a Christian, then I'm going to drill down on it. But uh, I share the gospel with a homosexual same way I do with anyone else. And if God saves that person, guess what goes away? Homosexuality goes away. I want us to look at what the faith preachers teach about the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. They have a very, very low view of God's sovereignty. Watch this from Benny Hinn and Miles Monroe. the mind of God about his will, we pray it. When we pray it, we give him legal right to perform it. Yes. Let me define prayer for you in this show. Prayer is man giving God permission or license to interfere in earth's affairs. In other words, prayer is earthly license for heavenly interference. That's incredible. That is incredible. God could do nothing on earth. Nothing has God ever done on earth without a human giving him access. So he's always looking for that somebody. Always looking for a human to give him power, permission. In other words, God has the power, but you get the permission. God got the authority and the power, but you got the license. So even though God could do anything, he can only do what you permit him to do. God can only do what we permit him to do. Dear friends, I would submit to you this morning that God can do whatever he jolly well wants to do and is not losing a great deal of anthropomorphic sleep over whether or not he has our permission to do it. And I take no joy in this. I just point it out as a matter of fact. Um, almost 10 years ago now, Miles Monroe, the guy you saw in that clip, died when his private jet crashed, killed him, his wife, and six other people, pilot and others. I don't think God needed his permission to bring that plane down. Watch this from Andrew Womack. Question. 
And I know that many people have said this, maybe in these exact words or possibly you've rephrased it, but you've said, why does God let things like this happen? You know, when you say something like that, that shows that you are making an assumption that God could just control things if he wanted to, that God could stop this. And you know what? That is an absolutely wrong assumption. And I can guarantee you with a lot of the religious doctrine that we have, especially the sovereignty of God teaching, there are going to be people all over the world that are just shocked that I would say something like that because they believe that, of course, God can do anything he wants to. That is not true. There are people that believe that God can do anything he wants to. That is not true, says Andrew Womack. Really. Well, my Bible says our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. I showed that verse one time to a Word of Faith proponent, and uh, he said, well, that just means that God can do whatever he wants to do in heaven, not on earth, you see, because if he wants to do something on earth, then he has to have our permission. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and in earth, in the seas and in all the deeps. Oops. Friends, God can do whatever he wants to do. Watch this from Jesse Duplantis. Friends have frank and open conversations with each other. I've done that with the Lord. I've had the Lord say, uh, Jesse, I've had God come tell me, he said, this is what I'm going to do. I've had the Lord say, what do you think about this? God has asked me for my opinion. God asks Jesse Duplantis for his opinion? Mm -hmm. Do tell. <coughs> Ask. Uh, maybe I'm doing it. He said, no, we can talk frankly. What do you think? I said, well, I don't think you ought to do that. He said, why you don't think you ought to do that? I said, well, you know, I, I know you know people more than I do, but you know, Lord, if you just let me, let me do a little bit more work on this individual, I think we can get them to you. He says, okay, go ahead. Do what you have to do. And I tell you what, the Bible says, he who wins souls is wise. And he who thinks he can counsel God is a fool. God speaking, who has directed the spirit of the Lord or as his counselor has informed him? With whom did he consult and who gave him understanding? Well, I, I guess it was Jesse Duplantis. You see the just inconceivable arrogance of these people. This from Creflo. I want us to look at the Christology of the word faith movement. What they teach about the person and work of Christ. This from Creflo Dollar. Creflo Dollar says, and somebody said, well, Jesus came as God. Well, how many of you know the Bible says God never sleeps nor slumbers? And yet in the book of Mark, we see Jesus asleep in the back of the boat. Jesus came as a man. And at age 30, God is now getting to, ready to demonstrate to us and give us an example of what a man with the anointing can do. Y'all, please listen to me. Please listen to me. This ain't no heresy. I'm not some false prophet. <laughs> Dear friends, as a general rule of thumb, if a preacher actually has to tell you that he's not a false prophet, <laughs> chances are. So... Creflo Dollar says that because Jesus was asleep in the back of the boat and God never sleeps or slumbers and therefore Jesus could not have been God. That is ridiculous. Dear friends, when Jesus came to this earth, he was truly God. He had been the second person of the triune God from when? From eternity past. And when he came to this earth, his deity did not change but he took upon himself a new nature, an additional nature, a human nature. So Jesus was one person with how many natures? Two, two distinct natures. Truly God, truly man, fully God, fully man, two natures and one person. And as the God man, Jesus experienced the same things that you and I experience. He got hungry, he got thirsty, and guess what? He got sleepy. It does not mean that he was not God. It's ridiculous. 
Watch this from Kenneth Copeland. For the coming high priest of the heavenly holy of holies was hanging on that cross. And then he went to hell. He went before and stood in the heavenly courts of justice. A sin free, born again, man. And God called him righteous. Kenneth Copeland says that Jesus was a sin-free, born-again man. They actually teach that Jesus had to get saved. You see, the faith preachers don't believe that Jesus paid for our sins on the cross. They believe that he really paid for our sins down in hell. They teach that when Jesus was on this earth, he was just a man, a man who had a close walk with God but was not actually God in human flesh. And when Jesus was on the cross, then he, the work of the atonement had not been completed. It had just begun. Then he went to hell, suffered, tortured by demons, died a spiritual death, ceased to be God and had to be reborn, that Jesus actually had to get saved in hell. And that is where the true atonement of our sins took place according to the faith preachers, not on the cross, but down in hell. That is blasphemy, absolute blasphemy. What did Jesus say on the cross? It is finished. His atoning work was completed on the cross. What did he say to the thief? Today you will be with me where? Paradise. Not here we go to hell. It's just unbelievable to me. Every cult, every cult disparages the cross of Christ that it somehow just was not enough to pay for sins. Mormons disparage it. Jehovah's Witnesses disparage it. And the Word of Faith movement disparages the cross of Christ. This from Kenneth Hagin. Every man who has been born again is an incarnation, and Christianity is a miracle. The believer is as much an incarnation as was Jesus of Nazareth. You and I are just as much an incarnation as was Christ. Just total blasphemy. Total blasphemy. I want to show you a clip from... Las Vegas International Christian Church. Now, it is pastored by Denise Goulet. She and her husband co-pastor this church. And as I said last night, if you, have, if you go to a church with a female pastor, you have neither a pastor nor do you have a church. But um, so Pastrix Denise Goulet, they're at this uh, Sunday morning service, and they have a very special guest this particular Sunday morning, none other than Donald Trump himself. President of the United States of America, Donald Trump, is in attendance and he walks up on the platform. Now, what I'm about, this is not a knock on Donald Trump, okay? Donald Trump is no theologian. And, 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 I, and he was, let me say this, he was very, very, very poorly served by his spiritual advisory board. When you look at the people that he, were his spiritual advisors, Paula White was the chairwoman of it. And she is as much of a scoundrel as you will ever meet. And, by the way, Robert Jeffress and Jack Graham, two of the biggest names in the Southern Baptist Convention, they also served on that board. And, and they endorsed her publicly, called Paula White their good friend, and they endorsed her book to everyone. That is... That is ministerially disqualifying. Two of the biggest names in the Southern Baptist Convention. But at any rate, I digress. Watch this 
Listen to what Denise Goulet says about Donald Trump. Listen to this very carefully as he takes the stage. What I was hearing the Lord say was, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. Can you believe that? This is my son in whom I am well pleased. And she says that about Donald Trump. Not only did she say that about Donald Trump, she said, this is what the Lord is telling me. So she adds blasphemy upon blasphemy. She teaches the blasphemy that Donald Trump is the only begotten son of God. And then she ascribes that very heresy to none other than God himself. She lays that heresy at God's feet. It is a testimony to the patience and forbearance of God that that entire building did not collapse and kill every person in there when she said that. Watch this from Larry Huck and Paula White. When we really begin to understand that, that, that when Jesus Christ paid the price, the first thing that happened after he said it is finished is the veil was rent from top to bottom, signifying that no man could do that. But the price that was paid was there's now no separation. So that we have direct access in the Holy of Holies. We understand, according to Hebrews, that Jesus is our high priest. Absolutely. And he's the first of many brethren, which means I now come into a priestly anointing. So I now... Say that again because now, they don't get it. I now come into a priestly anointing. Jesus is not the only begotten on. Son of God. He is not. I'm a son of he's God. He's the first fruit. You're the, you're the, he's the first fruit. He's the first born of many. Okay. Jesus is not the only begotten on. Son of God. Can you believe that? Jesus is not the only begotten Son of God. Have they read John 3.16? I mean, friends... We're not talking here about the date of the Exodus. We're not talking here about who you think wrote the book of Hebrews. These issues go to the heart of the gospel. What one believes about Jesus Christ will determine where one spends eternity. If they preach a different Jesus, they preach a different gospel. Watch this from Seth Dahl. Now, that's probably not a name with which you're familiar, but Seth Dahl up until recently was on staff at Bethel Church and that's where this video was recorded. Just watch. Bethel Church, that's Bill Johnson out in Redding, California. Just, just watch this. Oh, let me preface it. I want to point this out. You'll notice that when this clip begins, it's, you're going to see the Bethel logo and their music. And I point that out for this reason. What you're about to see is not something that accidentally kind of slipped past the editors. It's not something that they thought, oh man, ugh, I wish that hadn't have gotten out. No, what you're about to see, they are actually using in their advertisements. In other words, they're proud of it. Watch. Let's see, here we go. I had a pastor say some things that hurt me really bad. Hurt me so bad, messed me up. Emotionally, mentally, really messed me up. Nothing physical, nothing like that. A, a, a pastor I, I really respected said some words and hurt me so bad. And one time I was laying on the floor, actually it was in this room. I'm laying on the floor and in, an, in a vision, in an encounter with God, in a vision, Jesus picks me up and holds me so close that I can't see anything. And he holds me so close and Jesus starts to weep. And he says, please forgive me. Please forgive me. I said, what are you talking about? Please forgive you. He said, when that pastor hurt you, it's as if I hurt you. 
because he's a member of my body. Please forgive me. Can you believe that? The very notion that the second person of the triune God, the spotless Son of God, the Lamb without blemish would come down to a vile, sinful, wretched rebel and ask that thing for forgiveness? Unbelievable. Sometimes blasphemy, you just, you, I find myself wishing almost for a stronger word, as if that's not strong enough. But, it, like, how do you teach such things? Now, there's only a couple of possibilities here. He is either making this up out of whole cloth, which is the most likely scenario. He's just making it up because the real Jesus did not say that to him. So he's either making it up, or if he did get some kind of vision in which some Jesus said to him, please forgive me, then this guy is up to his eyeballs in demonic activity. Only two possibilities. Only two, and neither one of those is a good one. This is why I say that it is not we as cessationists who have a low view of the Holy Spirit. It is they who have a low view of the Holy Spirit of God. Dear friends, these people are not Christians. And you may be thinking, oh, Justin, that, that sounds so harsh. How can you say that? Because if they were truly Christians, if they were truly indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, then the very first time they taught one of these blasphemies, then the Holy Spirit of God would drop them to their knees under such heavy conviction. You wouldn't have to be saved more than about five seconds to know that that's heresy. And yet they continue to teach these things with reckless abandon year after year after year, decade after decade after decade. They have been called to repent by me and a thousand others, and yet they refuse to do so. That is not someone who is indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. My view of the Holy Spirit of God is far too high to allow for that. The Holy Spirit of God is not a weakling. He's not a girly man. He's strong. If he is strong enough to save us, he is strong enough to deliver us out of deception. And it doesn't get much darker than that. That's Bethel Church. I have called Bethel Church a cult, and it is a cult. I want to show you, as we'll wrap up here, um, three short clips from one baptismal service that they had back in 2019. Now, the way Bethel Church does their baptisms, they do them on Sunday night, and they have all the baptismal candidates, not every Sunday night, but once or twice a month. They have all the baptismal candidates come up front, and one of the Bethel staffers will have a microphone, and he goes up to each person, and he asks them two questions. First question, what is your name? Second question, why do you want to be baptized? I want to show you three clips just from one baptismal service. This was all just on one night. Watch. One of the great privileges of being on the staff here is that we get to baptize people. I'm going to ask a couple of questions, and then we're going to go ahead and begin to baptize people tonight. Well, two of those questions is one is your name, and the second of all is why you're being baptized tonight. And so let's start with you. What, what was your name, and, and uh, why are you wanting to be baptized tonight? <laughs> My name's Michaela. <laughs> And, and, and why are you wanting to be baptized? Oh, it's Jesus is King. <laughs> I love him so much, and I'm a child of God. <laughs> Come on. Come on, give her a round of applause, amen. That's... Do you think that young lady has any idea what she's doing? Not a clue. Getting baptized is a joke to her. She's laughing about it, and she's acting drunk, you know, acting intoxicated. Like, she, you know, that's their thing of being drunk in the spirit. I don't think she's actually intoxicated, not with alcohol. She's just, that's a, a thing they do. You know, they, they claim the Holy Spirit is just so strong on them. They can't just, they can't even control their body. Never mind that one of the fruits of the Spirit is 
self-control. But she has no idea what she's doing, no understanding of what she's doing, no sense of the, the weight of what she's doing. It's a joke. It's a joke. After she left, uh, this young lady came up. And where'd you come from? What was your name? And tell us why you're being baptized tonight. My name is Camille, and I hope that tonight's bas baptism excuse me, will cause some positive influences in my life, positive things in my life, future opportunities, and strengthen my relationship with God. Camille, that's amazing. Thank you. Do you think that young lady has any idea what she's doing? Not a clue. She, I, I call that baptism the good vibrations baptism because she wants to be baptized hoping that it will cause some positive things in her life. That's not why you get baptized at all on any level. She has no idea what she's doing, no understanding of the gospel. But they baptized her. Believe it or not, it gets worse. Friend, why'd you come over? Tell us your name and tell us why you're being baptized tonight. Hi, I'm Crystal. And <laughs> I just know that God is calling me to be a warrior for his animal kingdom and that I'm to lead angels of our, an army of angels to protect animals across the world. <laughs> And I just know I can't do it without God. <laughs> Come on, give Christoph a round of applause. That's amazing, sweet. Do you think she has any idea what she's doing? She wants to be baptized so she can be a warrior for the animal kingdom. Hakuna Matata. <laughs> she has absolutely no idea what she's doing. But they baptized her. And now she thinks she's a Christian when she doesn't have the faintest idea as to what the gospel is. This cult is leading millions of people straight to hell. Let not many of you desire to become teachers, my brethren, knowing that we will incur a stricter judgment. They are making a mockery of the gospel. They are leading people to hell. These people, and friends, that's not, I'm not cherry picking here. I have watched dozens and dozens of these baptismal services, hundreds of people giving their quote unquote little testimonies. I can honestly tell you out of the hundreds I have watched, I have yet to hear a single person give even a first grade vacation Bible school testimony. And that, what you just saw, is some of the bad fruit that is coming from the pulpit of Bethel Church. That is the bad fruit that comes from Bill Johnson. And they're baptizing all these people. And these poor folks think they're okay. They think they're Christians because they want to be warriors for the animal kingdom. That's a cult. That's a gospel-denying cult. And let me say this as we close. It is very disheartening to me as I see how many of our evangelical churches out there sing Bethel and Hillsong music on Sunday morning. Even churches that are not in the Word of Faith, they're not even charismatic. Most Southern Baptist churches sing Bethel and Hillsong music on Sunday mornings. That is a shame. Because when you sing Bethel, and Hillsong is cut from the same cloth. Bill Johnson and Brian Houston at Hillsong, they're friends. They endorse each other. They speak at each other's conferences. When you sing that music, please understand you're singing music from a cult. And people say, oh, well, well, some of their songs are okay. Some of the lyrics are okay. Yeah, some of them are. Not all of them by any stretch, but some of them are. Some of their songs do have some lyrics that would pass a basic doctrinal smell test. But that is no excuse to sing their music 
because the unsuspecting person out there sitting in the pew on a Sunday morning and they're looking up at the screen and they see they're singing this song and they notice in the fine print down there at the bottom they say, oh music by Bethel huh music by Hillsong hmm. well they must be okay we're singing their music I think I'll check them out by their own admission they use their music as a hook to pull people into their false gospel. They pull people into their cult with their music. And if a church is doing what it should be doing, when you sing copyrighted music, a church should be singing, uh, sending in money to the CCLI licensing organization, which in turn funnels that money to the respective people who wrote the music. So please understand, when you sing Bethel, when you sing Hillsong music, you're funding a cult. You are sending money to a cult that is preaching a different Jesus and a different gospel and is leading millions of people to hell. It's not okay. It's not okay to sing their music. It's not okay. These are serious issues, dear friends. Very, very serious issues. I hope this has been helpful for you. This has just been a jet tour over the doctrines of the word faith movement. Uh, again, I do have some resources out there available for you. And uh, there's a sign-up sheet as well. If you'd like to put your name and email address, and I send out uh, e-newsletters, you know, just updates on the ministry. And uh, if you'd like to put your John Hancock and email address there, um, you won't go on any mailing list, I promise, other than mine. And I'll uh, give you updates for the ministry. You can that's out there as well. Um, after lunch, our next session is entitled Mangled Manifestations. That's when we're going to talk about tongues. I'm going to give you a demonstration of how to speak in tongues. That's coming up after lunch. So, um.